I've been asked to speak about the role health uh, funding reform might play in achieving the twin objectives of increased quality in the system and cost containment or bending the cost curve, as we've been phrasing it. Um, and I've been asked to speak particularly around pay for performance as one kind of funding uh, initiative that we might undertake, which as a number of speakers yesterday mentioned, uh, is a very popular uh, reform to undertake these days. Uh, it's done in a number of countries around the world now and at least a handful of Canadian provinces. Uh, so I'm going to speak uh, about pay for performance, but funding more generally. Uh, one caveat just at the start, I'm going to assume in some sense that in fact the twin objectives of cost containment and quality improvement are mutually compatible. Uh, we all talk about all the waste in the system and if we can just reduce inappropriate utilization, of course, both of those will both help contain costs and improve quality. Uh, but we can't forget that there's a whole lot of areas in our system where we are underperforming. People are not getting services they need. And so in many areas, quality is going to mean increased servicing and increased cost. The hope, of course, is over time, as you improve their health, it will reduce uh, the cost curve over time. But initially, there's going to be some investments that have to mean increased services. But I'll assume that overall, it's not unreasonable to think that we can achieve both of these simultaneously. So let me begin with uh, what do I mean by pay for performance? And I, I'm, I define it as the explicit use of targeted financial incentives to encourage specific behaviors intended to improve quality of care. And a few things are important here. It's targeted financial incentives. I want to distinguish that from the fact that every system of funding creates incentives, financial incentives. It's unavoidable. And any conscientious policymaker is going to pay attention to those incentives when they design the system of funding. It's different, however, in an extra step to say, I'm going to choose to use financial incentives actively as a policy tool to try and generate specific behaviors that I think are desirable. I think those are different policy exercises. And pay for performance is the latter. And it's a very intuitive idea, it's a very powerful idea. And it's also very appealing if you're a policymaker because in some sense it says, I don't have to get mixed up in the messiness of reforming the delivery system or anything else. If I just give them the right incentives, the docs and the nurses and the hospitals, they'll go off and they'll figure out themselves how to do this. So it's much more attractive from a policymaker's point of view as well, which is why I think we see so much movement towards pay for performance in the last uh, 10 or 15 years around the world. Uh, what do I mean concretely? I'll give you a couple of examples uh, from Ontario, which has been the province that's moved most in, term, in terms of pay for performance in Canada. This is a, a bonus payment scheme for preventive services, and I just put one up here for pap smears. Of course, this is a, a documented effective service for certain population groups to get on a regular basis. And so Ontario is given incentive to its doctors. If you can get at least 60% of your patient population in the target, in the target population, uh, this service during the period uh, under of, um, uh, of during which they should get it, you'll get a bonus of $220 each year. If you can get up to 80% of that population, we'll give it $2,200 each year. And there's a whole set of preventive services structured exactly like this, right, in terms of the, a threshold set of levels to get bonus payments above and beyond what you get for pro providing the service in the first place. This is a very popular way to design pay for performance around the world. There's another approach, also this is an example from Ontario, this is also used in other uh, provinces in Canada, more common under chronic disease where you introduce a code, in this case we know that chronic disease patients management is an important part of, of good quality. The fee code we say doesn't currently pay for that, so we'll, we'll create a new code for managing your diabetic patient in this case. And the doctor is supposed to keep a chart, a, a flow chart they call it, I think, flow sheet that tracks all these parameters. What's the cholesterol, what's the you know, insulin, what eye care, so on and so forth. And the idea is we need to, the system has been paying for this, so let's pay for it. And in this case, the physician can bill $37 up to three times a year for each diabetic patient that they have in their practice. So these are two examples, one's used in Canada. Uh, there are lots of variations on this theme, but let me now turn to the question of, does it work? So I want to start with Canadian evidence 
that uh, has recently come out from the Ontario schemes, and then I'll look more generally uh, at international evidence. In Ontario, they introduced pay for performance in a big way in 2004 in their agreement that year with the doctors. Uh, it included both of the kinds of payments I just mentioned. So we did a study, at the, we're working with the ministry, to look at what impact did that incentive scheme have on the provision of these preventive care services. And there were a few other ones, but I'm just going to focus on preventive care. And so we compared trends before and after and compared it to a group of physicians who were not exposed to the incentives, they weren't eligible, uh, to try and identify what impact the incentives have. Here's, I'm giving you the five services we're able to look at, the seniors flu shot, toddler immunization, pap smear, mammogram, and colorectal cancer screening. And on the right, I've given you the baseline level of provision uh, in the year before the incentives were put into place. So 55% of seniors got the flu shot. 65% uh, of women got mammograms in the target populations to which this should go. So we would like all these to be one, essentially, is, is the goal. We're doing particularly poorly, you can see, on colorectal cancer screening. So then the program came into place. They got these bonus payments or eligibility for the bonus payments. What happened? So the middle column is the absolute increase in the rate of coverage. So for a senior flu shot, coverage went from 55.4% of the seniors to, what, that 58.2%. For uh, the other services you would interpret correctly, Toddler immunization, 54% to 55%, essentially. You'll see they're all positive. They responded the way we would have expected them to respond in direction. Four of the five are statistically significant. But I would argue that, in fact, overall, they're of no policy significance. They're just too small. The government is spending 55 to $60 million a year in payments for these five services to achieve this level of change in service provision. I doubt that's what they were hoping for when they introduced this program. If I look at the diabetes management assessment fee, I'm sorry, I didn't realize how low this slide was going to be. Some of you probably can't see some of this. This was a study done by Rick Lazier and his colleagues in ISIS. And they looked at just before or after. What happened after this fee for diabetic management was, in, was introduced? First of all, only 25, the physicians for only 25% of the patients even billed the code. So clearly it could not have had a big effect because 75% of the doctors never billed it even once. The compliance they found was that it had no impact on the receipt of the three key evidence-based services associated with They could measure service delivery. It's all the honor system whether or not you actually keep this flow chart. Nobody checks that. But we can measure did they actually deliver some of these specific services. No change. So what happened? It was a big windfall gain for those who were already performing well and no change on the people who weren't. And this is going to be a theme that we'll see. So not promising evidence coming out of Canada, what does the world more generally say? There have been a number of systematic reviews of pay for performance schemes going back 10 years anyways. And here's some representative conclusions out of those systematic reviews. Almost all of them end up saying, well, there's insufficient evidence at present to identify the impact of pay for performance and therefore use it as a, to design good pay for performance schemes. And the problem relates to what Alan Maynard mentioned in his talk yesterday. A lot of the studies don't have really good designs. And so if you're a methodologist doing a systematic review, you're going to say, well, I can't conclude what the effect of pay for performance was because there was bias, there was selection bias as to who got the incentive, there was confounding by other things going on in the system. And so that's fair from a pure methodology point of view. What I would argue is in almost all the cases, the biases present in the study to the extent they were there were towards a favorable finding. <laughs> they would suggest we would expect to find something and we were attributing something to pay for performance that probably might be something else going on. And still, the evidence is very mixed. A little bit of action on this service, no action on that service. So I interpret this really saying, after all these years, dozens of studies, there's no reason to believe this is going to be an effective way to improve quality in our healthcare system. It's just, it isn't, the evidence is not there. Yes, you can find a few things here and there, but systematically, on average, it doesn't work as we had hoped it would. What about saving costs? There's no really evidence on what happens to overall system costs as a result of pay for performance. 
What we do know is it's a very expensive way per unit of change because of what I spoke about earlier. You end up paying bonuses to all the people who are already doing just fine in order to get a few people at the margin to change their behavior. So of course it becomes very expensive on average. Just like universal screening versus targeted screening. Right? You're, doing, you're paying a lot of money to people who are already doing what you wanted to get a few people to change. So my overall conclusion is that pay for performance cannot play a substantial role in trying to improve quality in a healthcare system. The evidence isn't there. The evidence isn't there that's going to control costs. And if you think for a moment, you would know that it couldn't be the basis for a serious, sustained, comprehensive effort at quality. The number of services that can be tied explicitly to payment that relates to quality, it's just too small. The same set of services, country after country, it's a few preventive services, it's a few chronic diseases, it, it, it's a tiny bit of the system, even if it were effective, that it, that it could change. So it just can't, it cannot form the basis for a serious quality improvement. So does this mean incentives and funding are not a way to go forward and to think about trying to generate both bending the cost curve and improvement in quality? Well, I would say no. Funding matters, and funding matters a lot. And again, I want to go back to the distinction. Pay for performance is about targeted incentives to achieve specific behavior changes. Funding creates, clearly, incentives for provider behavior. And when you compare fee-for-service versus case-based versus habitation, global budgets, we know from decades that that affects provider behavior. The basic incentives and the base payment method matters a lot to what providers do and what they pay attention to. We have good evidence on costs, less well evidence on quality, uh, less good evidence on quality, uh, but it matters. So we have to pay attention to funding when we think about bending the cost curve and achieving improved quality. Both because the incentives, and that is the, the clear evidence is the increased extent to which payment is prospective. In other words, the extent to which the amount that a provider or an organization receives is determined independent of how many specific services they provide. So fee-for-service is very, very not, pr not prospective, it's retrospective. Capitation, global budgeting are highly prospective. Clearly, prospectiveness helps with cost control. We know that. And the evidence is it has no detrimental effect on quality <laughs> to the extent that it's been looked at. The, a lot of studies, a lot of it out of prospective payment, a lot of it in the US context, but no clear evidence that it, that it reduces quality, which is a concern for some if, if, if they have incentives to skimp on care if they don't get extra money. But to, for me, what's more important even when we think about quality improvement is these different payment methods create very different scope for creating innovative delivery arrangements, production, ways to produce services, either through different types of personnel, through different types of technology, through different types of relationships between different parts <coughs> of the system. So under capitation, you have much more flexibility to adopt these kinds of innovative methods than as we've heard under fee-for-service, where you've got to have the provider, the physician, bill the service to get the money. So I, I think it affects both because the incentives for amounts of servicing and types of services, but also for how to produce them. And I think that latter is a really important part when we think about what has to happen to improve quality in the system, because we know we need to change the way we deliver services. So what, where are the directions funding is going right now? Well, as I say, there's a move towards increased prospectiveness with some attempt towards linking it to quality, not necessarily in specific actions like the paper performance, but attempts to link it towards quality uh, in a way that historically, for instance, capitation has not. It's just been you get a fixed amount and you go away and do what you want. So they're, tr they're trying to, to draw some link. There's increased linkages across parts of the system, primary care, secondary care, institutional care, uh, to try and make providers think about the, a bigger set of services simultaneously and care about a bigger set of services simultaneously rather than just their own uh, neighborhood. And there's increasing appreciation about the need to think about funding in delivery organizations simultaneously. Historically, they were almost seen as inter independent, interchangeable. Well, funding's one question, delivery arrangements another, and we can mix and match. I think there's increasing appreciation of the need to tailor funding and delivery organizations jointly in an integrated way so that the actors 
who's faced the various incentives have the ability to respond ha and have the ability to make the changes that will improve quality and help control costs. Two examples, uh, Uwe Reinhardt yesterday talked about bundled models. Uh, this is where you're trying to extend the idea of DRG or case-based hospital payment to the forward set of the system. So now the payment will go towards hospital care, ambulatory care, rehab perhaps, around a specific condition or specific you know, episode of care. And it's to get the organization, and this is a question, who gets it and how does it get div divided? Right now, they're trying to work with this in situations where you don't have a single organization like a big HMO, but you've got the hospital, you've got a physician group, you've got different organizations, and they have to negotiate and sort out how they're going to work through these arrangements. Um, there's an there's attempt to make the payment levels linked to evidence-based practice. So what should they get if they're practicing good medicine? And this is the way they're trying to link it into quality, uh, rather than just say you're going to get the average price even if that includes a bunch of unnecessary services. Another thing, I can't even see this, but I think it's shared, uh, shared savings models, which again, uh, uh, were mentioned yesterday. And this is more, in our language, this is soft global budgets applied at the level of patient population. They get a, there's a budget set, the organization says we're going to take responsibility for care, and if they can come in less than this budget, and if they meet in certain quality targets, they get to share the savings. Uh, uh, we heard a, a, a note of pessimism about the work of this yesterday, and I would have to say I share the pessimism around this arrangement. I don't see why it's going to generate what they're hoping for. And I think we've, already, we've had global budgets in Canada before. I don't think a lot of people want to go back there right now. Um, so I don't know how applicable this might be to Canada, but this is one approach that's being used to try and, again, uh, bring these together. Directions for us. Uh, again, funding reform is an important part of improving quality and bending the cost curve, quote unquote, but it's only one part of a coordinated set of policies, especially on the quality agenda. I think we need to design payment systems that will support and reinforce complementary initiatives to improve quality, but I think the most important signals around quality have to come from non-financial programs that appeal to professional ethics, that appeal to what people know they should be doing in their practices, and changing the culture in the organization and the way they practice, independent, it's not independent of, because it, it, the, the funding model has to support that change. They have to reinforce each other. But I don't think you lead with the financial incentive. You create a financial context in which they can do the things you want them to do without being penalized for doing it. There, I think we should move towards blended payment models, especially obviously in primary care where there has been sub-movement over the last 10 years. We have need to do more of that. And here I'm, I'm speaking about where a practice gets a mix of capitation fee for service, maybe some programmatic funding. I, I think in some ways we underplay programmatic funding where you, you say you have a very good initiative, you want to experiment with something, here, we'll give you some program funding to go try it for a while and see what goes on. I think we can mix and match this in a way that will um, generate more activity, more innovation. Uh, I think it should be, for primary care, a majority capitation. Uh, the uh, physicians now are accepting these kinds of blended models, so we don't face the political opposition we did when we were trying to shove capitation down their throat 25 years or 20 years ago or 15 years ago, right? They, they know that these models can work, and, and we've been moving this way, and I think we need to do more of this. I think we do need to start moving towards better linking funding across the sectors. Canada is, I think, a long ways from being able to do this, frankly. Uh, how best to do this, I don't know. There, do we want to do bundled payment? I know in Ontario the Quality Council is exploring this as an option to try and implement some bundled payment models. Um, we don't even have experience in Canada with just institutional based bundled payment for hospitals. How we're going to move to doing it across sectors is a huge challenge. Uh, the, again, the organization of the system is, will raise a lot of challenges. Uh, quite apart from, it's really difficult to set these rates. How do you set the bundle payment rate? How do you define an episode? When the diabetic has you know, multiple complications, what goes on? What do you count as part of the episode? Not, you know, some of this is all technical stuff that of course you work through over time and so on and so forth. But we're, we're a long ways from being able to implement, I think, bundle payment models. 
Some have suggested, again, I can't see it, but I think it says gain sharing, uh, a, a, a version in which essentially you, tell the ho you let the hospitals and physicians cut some deals where if the physician's actions can save the hospital money, they split the savings. And so they're both they're just share, sharing the savings where the physician now has an interest in the cost of the hospital itself. Some people have been pushing for this in the last little while. Uh, I don't know what the scope is. I don't know how it could work out, but this is one approach people are suggesting. I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm leery about some approaches like this, but I think we need to frankly try some things and see, and see what might work. But again, lots of uh, difficulties doing this. The basic principle, uh, I would follow is there's virtue and simplicity and transparency. Uh, when you read about some of the things people are doing around the world, it is so complicated, you can't even understand how anyone would figure out what the incentives are or even what they should be doing. I think there's real value in making it clear, trying to keep it as simple as you can within reason uh, and transparent so everyone knows what's, uh, what's going on and what's at stake and what each, each one should be doing. Thank you.